her story was that as a, as a really young girl, she was actually sold into um, a begging circle and trafficked to Bangkok. And every day went out onto the streets of Bangkok and begged for money. It was a horrendous life of begging on the streets 12, 14 hours every single day. Mm. And for whatever reason, um, Wow wasn't seen as a good beggar. So one day when she was uh, brought back off the streets and into the room that they all lived in, she was separated from the other children and a man walked in and threw a litre of battery acid in her face. So that impacted me like I cannot even tell you. I, I flew back to Australia and every single morning the first person I'd think about was Wow. Mm. Um, and actually her story and the feeling that I had around Cambodia sat with me for five years. Welcome to the Things You Can't Unhear podcast. I'm your host, Maritza Barone. In this show, I will introduce you to ideas, concepts, and mindsets that will open your mind to a new world of well being and personal life growth. Through eye opening interviews, we elevate people in the world doing amazing things for humanity and share insights that will shift you to become the happiest, healthiest, kindest, and most compassionate version of you. In today's episode, we share the story of Liz Volpe. Now, Liz is one of Australia's most prominent female entrepreneurs, driven by an unshakable belief that the pursuit of our dreams can positively affect change in the world. She shares her story of success that is merged with her passion and her purpose and gives us ideas on how we can build our own business that creates good in the world. This episode will inspire and empower you to get moving with a bold idea that you may have been sitting on for a while and drive you to dream big and design the life that you want. Now, to let you know a little bit more about Liz, her life's purpose is to educate the youth of today in entrepreneurial thinking. And she's done that with an inspiring new company called Project Gen Z that she founded some years after a trip to Cambodia with the Sunrise Cambodia team that changed her life. Liz is also the co-founder of the League of Extraordinary Women, running conferences for women with purpose-driven business strategies to connect. The League now has a growing, passionate community of over 200,000 people. And if that's not enough, she's also the director of Zest Possibilities, a market leader in outsourcing promotions and marketing campaigns, through which she has helped to raise $175 million for Australian and international charities. She is an outstanding role model and leading change maker of our time. And when you hear her story and her passion, you can't help but walk away feeling inspired to make your own mark and change the world. Liz, it's so wonderful to have you here with us on Things You Can't Unhear to share your spark and joy on the world. Thank you. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited too. <laughs> Look, my mission is to elevate those doing amazing things for humanity and you certainly fit the bill there. You know, this podcast is aimed to shift people into exciting and inspiring life progression. Now, you have wow. certainly, you know, you've certainly paved an incredible, successful career for yourself over the years, but you're doing it with such purpose and selflessness. Have you always had an entrepreneurial spirit? It's funny that actually just last night I remembered, um, I don't know why this popped into my head, but I started to think about when I was 17 years old. And uh, for some reason, I got it into my head that I really wanted to start a business. Mm. And I decided to start this promotions company, um, which didn't, like, do anything at all. <laughs> but <laughs> I was just remembering with fond memories about all of the things I used to try and do uh, when I was really young. I've got no idea where my ideas used to come from. Um, <laughs> the only thing I know is that I was surrounded by really great people. And my mum had actually, she's kind of quite entrepreneurial and she'd always run a few businesses when I was growing up so I think that's where it comes from. <laughs> oh, I totally resonate with that. I had a, t a ton of little businesses that I that would spruik up every now and then so I, I feel <laughs> yeah. that same spirit within myself. Now tell us about your journey. You came to Australia in your early 20s and as you call it you had a backpack full of dreams. Talk us through yeah. that time. Yeah I mean the reason I even backpacked in the first place was because I was 21 and I'd gone through uni and to be honest, only went to uni because I had no idea at all what else to do. So I chose this course, which was media studies, um, 
number one, because I couldn't get into any other course because I wasn't really <laughs> that smart. Um, and it just seemed fun. <laughs> so I'd gone through and done this course and got to the end of it and kind of jumped into the big wide world of work and started to do you know three four jobs at the same time just to kind of like get money and try and figure out what I wanted to do and I just got to this point in my life where I was like wow the only thing that I've ever really liked in my life was the tv show neighbors <laughs> so imagine if I could go to Australia um, maybe I could get a, a little role on neighbors that's honestly what I thought <laughs> at 21 so just suddenly made this super quick decision um, to travel the world and booked this one way six months round the world trip and the rest was history to be honest I I kind of got a month in and landed in Australia and the minute I landed on the plane and that those doors opened I just had that gut feeling I was just never ever gonna leave well who knew um, Ramsey Street could do that to a person I know. I'm sure there's so many English people that's happened to as well. <laughs> I think you're right. Now, you since that time, you've obviously carved a very successful career. You have a number of different businesses that you have founded. You've got Zest Possibilities. You've got the League of Extraordinary Women and Project Gen Z, which is yeah. um, through the Dare to Dream series. Now, I want to talk about all of these things. We have touched on it in the introduction, but I'd love to get your journey through those businesses and how you were inspired to start them? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess the the big pivotal life moment for me was actually starting my first ever company, Zest Possibilities. Um, you know, I, I kind of touched on it. Before that point, I was, you know, this young girl that had never really been that good at anything in my life. And I had this incredible hunger and it had always been there since I remember. Um, so during school and uni and, and even my journey into work, like I really wanted to find something I was good at and I just couldn't. And I, aside from that, I, I was looking for something that I, that I would actually jump out of bed every single day for. And I didn't find that either. So coming to Australia, I started to work in um, event promotions, actually. So, you know, a super fun job. I'd work at all of these big festivals and sporting events. And my job was really simply it was to stop people and chat to them about whatever brand I was promoting at the time and I absolutely loved it um it definitely wasn't for everyone some people found it extremely tough you know getting a million people say no to you or ignore you and not want to stop um for me it was this new challenge and I realized at that point wow the, the one thing that I can do is communicate I was really really good at it and this led me to basically starting my own company from scratch uh, I kind of came up with this really big dream like um, if I could do anything like what would it be that I could do and the first thing that I wrote down was actually run my own company and because promotions was the thing I was doing at the time that's exactly what I decided <laughs> to do um, and it was honestly a case of a bit of googling on how to do that and also um because I'd been working in promotions for quite a while, I was surrounded by some really great mentors. So at the age of 28, I launched Zest Possibilities um, with no money at all, just some super big dreams and a really big vision to launch number, the number one Australian promotions company um, and this other really big dream of somehow raising $200 million for charity. So you had and that goal from the start from the very beginning yeah yeah there was this particular point this day that kind of changed everything for me um where I decided to do an exercise where I sat down on my floor with some big pieces of paper and textures and it was the first time I ever really dreamt for the first time in my life mm. and anything I, I kind of challenged myself to put down anything on paper that I would like absolutely love to do you know, and as a normal human being, what I found was happening was any time I thought of a really big goal, this horrible little voice would pop into my head and be like, you can't do that. You know, you're not good enough to do that. You don't have enough money to set up a business. That's right. That horrible negative voice. Um, but I just can't continue to write them down so I dreamt as big as possible. And that $200 million goal was, was then. It was back in 2006. Um, and that's kind of what that feeling a vision or and having a vision for the first time um, made it just a smooth journey. 
I launched my my company and we grew really, really fast purely because I was the most excited I'd ever been in my life about doing anything. You were self-driven at that stage, weren't you? You were absolutely, absolutely. self-driven, <laughs> purpose-driven. You knew the direction and you had an end result in your mind that you were going for. That's right. Do you think- it was a case of once I had that, I told everybody about that as well. Even though it, it felt really stupid, never running a business before, starting to interview people for my, you know, to come and work in my promotions business. I'd tell everyone the minute that they'd walk through the door. Um, and the first few times I'd say it out loud, it sounded really stupid and I felt really fake. But after saying, you know what it's like, after saying something for quite a few times, you start to believe it yourself. Exactly. <laughs> and everyone else believes it around you and suddenly you've got a movement of people that actually think it's going to happen too. Unbelievable. So you obviously built your confidence with that first company and you, you got out of your comfort zone, taking that plunge to start a business. And then you've yeah. just continued to do it. <laughs> you've just continued to, to go that step further. And your next business was the League of the Extraordinary Women. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit about that and how that came about? Yeah, I mean, this was, I've been running Zest for quite a long time at this, this um, point. And, you know, although I had massive success with the company, I was still a young girl surrounded actually by a lot of men um, <laughs> mm. trying to learn how to run a business as I went, Googling as much as I could. But I, I realized. God bless Google. I know. <laughs> I realized, wow, I really actually now need to learn how to run a business. Like, where can I go to do that? And who can I meet to, to actually support me in this? So I decided to search for basically entrepreneurial and business events. And I came across an event run by the entourage, Jack DeLosa. And I went in, so I booked to go to this business event. And I was so scared because I felt like an absolute fraud. But I went to this event and I remember this day so well. I walked in, I was a little bit late into the back of the room and I just remember seeing 500 heads in front of me. And I was searching around desperately trying to find a girl or a female in the mm. crowd. And I think I saw maybe like, I don't know, six, seven, you know, like long hair, long hairs at the back. And I was like, wow, where are all these females in business? And during the lunch break, I found three of them, um, Marie Cruz, Sarah Regalhuth, and Cheryl Ty, and they were all business owners in Melbourne, and I started to have a chat with them, and we were all like, wow, this is really crazy. Um, you know, we started to share stories about the struggles that we were going through, the ups and the downs, the wins, you know, the failures, um, and it was really great. You know, I felt massive relief being able to talk to, talk to someone like myself um, that understood we're like, you know what, we really should hold some type of little event and see if we can get find any other female founders in Melbourne. So we put a Facebook group together and we went to a local bar and booked a table for 12 people and put it on Facebook and it was absolutely crazy. In two weeks of placing the Facebook event, wow. we didn't just fill the table, we filled the entire bar of 80 female founders. Wow. That's when you know you're doing something that, number one, not only needs to be there, it's something that, that hadn't been filled yet, but it was something that you were sort of led to. It was funny. I mean, it, it, the league's always had a, a life of its own. I mean, it, it was born by accident. Um, mm. You know, and after that very first event, we were getting emails from not just all around Australia, but around the world saying, we want something like this here. <laughs> so we're like, and, oh God, well. We've had to turn this into a company somehow. Wow. So now you've got like over 200,000 community members that are part of this company yeah, that you just stumbled across. Very That's special. Right. Yeah, really special. Well, your career took a bit of a direction change when you had a visit to Cambodia some years back. Now, I've heard this story and it inspired me to no end to hear what drove you once you had that trip and saw the things that you did. And I'd love you to share it with everyone listening today, the experiences that opened your eyes to a different world and sort of shifted you on the next stage of your career, which brings us to where you really are at now in your career. Can you yeah. share that trip with us and, and how it all came about? Absolutely. So I was probably 10 years into my business journey running Best and a few years into the business journey of running the league. And Best was starting to feel 
uncomfortable for me is the way I'll put it. Um, I started to feel really stale. Um, I was finding it really hard to get out of bed anymore. And, you know, I think as an as a young business owner, I had these big dreams of making lots of money and getting that nice car and that house. And once I had all that, I was like, but what next? Um, so randomly at this point in my career, I went on a trip to Cambodia. It was a charity trip. Um, I went to see the work of Oxfam and then found myself at an orphanage run by an incredible lady called Geraldine Cox, um, an Australian lady. And she runs um, a not-for-profit in Cambodia called Sunrise. And Sunrise is basically a center that rescues kids from the most horrendous situations. So kids that have been rescued from begging circle, trafficking, child prostitution. Mm. Um, I, I just found myself there and I was surrounded by these beautiful kids of all different ages and I met an, a girl called Wow and basically when I first met Wow quite shocked um, her face was comp- and, her, and her entire body was completely full of scars but talking to her just for a few minutes um, she was incredible like not only did she speak great English she had so much optimism she just this potential kind of oozed out of her. And it was almost like if I could pop, pop her into Australia, I knew that she'd just do really well in, in something. So I was really surprised to learn of her story after chatting to her. And her story was that as a, as a really young girl, she was actually sold into um, a begging circle and traffic to Bangkok. And every day went out onto the streets of Bangkok and begged for money. Um, she probably lived with, you know, 30, 40 other kids that had also been trafficked and you know, this horrendous life of begging on the streets 12, 14 hours every single day. Mm. And for whatever reason, um, Wow wasn't seen as a good beggar. So one day when she was uh, brought back off the streets and into the room that they all lived in, she was separated from the other children and a man walked in and threw a litre of battery acid in her face. Mm. And she was left... Um, once she had healed, she was back on the streets begging again. Absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah, I mean, really hard to kind of comprehend and get your head around. Um, so when I heard that, and I, it didn't even match with the girl that I'd just been speaking to, like how could this girl go through so much trauma, yet be so optimistic and with this hope and this drive? Um, so that impacted me like I cannot even tell you I, I flew back to Australia and every single morning the first person I think about was wow mm. um, and actually her story and the feeling that I had around Cambodia sat with me for five years and I probably said this to you or when you heard my story you know the only way that I describe it is like I woke up every single morning with an itch that I could not scratch mm. It's like I really wanted to do something in Cambodia, but again, that fear within me was like, well, what can I do? There's, there's nothing that I can do. Um, yeah, but eventually, I guess with a little bit of a, a kick up the bum by my husband, <laughs> I decided to act on that. And um, yeah, my life and everything has changed ever since. You were probably mentioning it every single day to him and he's like, you get up. and you Yeah, he was just sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do something, God damn it. <laughs> it's interesting. Recently I interviewed um, Rochelle Courtney. She started the Share the Dignity Foundation and it was the same sort of story with her where she saw a problem in the world and she couldn't not do something about it after she'd seen it. It was literally something she couldn't unhear or something she couldn't unsee, just like you. What is it? What's the, And I asked her this question and it was a profound answer as well, but what's the difference between seeing something and doing something about it to the, the opposite. A lot of us see things that are heartbreaking and absolutely soul gut-wrenching, but we, mm. we don't have the, the confidence or the guts or the bravery to do something about it. What is the difference? What is the driver for you to stand up and say, this is the thing that I'm going to help with? Like how long can I have this urge and this feeling around something without taking the action? You know, how long can I ignore that? Um, you know, during that five-year period, I also had children. Mm. And every single day, I'd look down at my son's face and I'd think about those kids in Cambodia and how lucky he was 
have someone and people around him that loved him. And it was just an absolute no brainer. Um, I, I'm not going to lie, I am probably one of the crazy ones that I don't think too about how I'm going to do it. I tell everyone I'm going to do it and I figure out how to, how to yeah. do the rest as I go. Starting's um, the first and most critical step, right? Yeah, that's right. But it was literally a case of the minute that my husband had kind of given me that push, every single thing just laid out in front of me. Like I knew within a split second exactly what I was going to do. It was a case of, well, what can I do to help these children? The only thing that I know that I can do and that I've proven to myself that I can do is to run a business. And I know how much business not only built my confidence, but allowed me to achieve my dreams. It was like, well, imagine if I could put together a team of people that had that same experience as me, you know, entrepreneurs from around the country that are passionate about inspiring and educating the next generation. Like, what if we could go over there and run a really simple business workshop that could teach them how to do, you know, to launch their own business? And from that split second of everything I've just said into that one second, <laughs> it was the case of I started to jump onto the phone to people that I knew. Andrew Morello was the first point of call, and he was the incredible guy at 21 years old that won the first ever Channel 9's The Apprentice. Oh, yes, I remember that. Yeah. yeah, and I phoned him, and I told him, and he was like, I'm in. And then I phoned the next person, and suddenly it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I, and I had this team of 25 entrepreneurs mm-hmm. that had all said yes. And the next day I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Everyone said yes, I've got to make this happen. I guess, um, you know, putting, putting myself in a position where I was completely accountable, my back was against the wall. I had to do it. Mm. So what was that first trip for you like? Wow. It was unbelievable, so special. Um, you know, I built this curriculum, and I'm not a teacher. Mm. I had no idea at all if it would work. In fact, the teachers in Cambodia when I landed actually told me that it wouldn't work. Um, we had 60% of the kids that didn't even speak English in our workshop. Um, so it was all done through a translator. Amazing. Yeah, what happened was just mind-blowing. Within an hour, not even an hour, within 15 minutes of launching the workshop the energy in the room just went through the roof um we went from having like a hundred quiet timid cambodian students to these loud energetic Mm -hmm. and determined students um that went out and launched their own business within a week and you know the winning business actually profited 400 us dollars in just two hours of selling their product which is more money than they've ever seen in their life exactly so you've, yeah, you've, you've, you've titled this Project Gen Z. Project it? Gen Z, yeah. Zed, yeah. And now where are we at with this project of yours? Wow. Well, I mean, it's, it's turned into my profession, you know, from that figuring out that, wow, this is what I want to do and this is my purpose. How now can I do this every day? Um, so the, the model that I built was I turned Project Gen Z into a social enterprise and we have a team of about 150 really successful and incredible entrepreneurs around Australia. We run our Dare Stream workshops in schools, primary schools and secondary schools. And a portion of that then goes to Sunrise Cambodia, who is now our charity partner. Um, and each year we go back to Sunrise and run these workshops. Um, so we've yeah educated now thousands and thousands of young people. You're, you're incredible, Liz. So for no. someone, <laughs> for someone who's listening wanting to identify and execute their own mark on the world and also be in business at the same time because I think that's something that you do very well. There's so many of us out there who really want to help and do something to shift humanity and make a change in the world but we also need an income and we also you know can't volunteer all of our services all the time. What's your advice to people who would like to merge the two to to have a business to have a thriving business and a thriving income, but also impact the world in a positive way? Yeah, great. You know, I, I, I love the world and I love Australia for the opportunities within this social enterprise space because this social enterprise is growing and growing and growing and it's still recognised now it's actually really easy to do. 
I always think that the most important thing to do if you want to make a mark is actually before you even think about the business, is start with your passion. Start with where you want to make a difference in the world and you work from that. Um, and I say that because you can make any business work if you are so passionate and um, invested into to making a difference. So once you've got the cause, then look at, well, what have you done up to now? Where has your career led you to? What are your skills? Then look at, well, what can you do to launch a business with a model where it is a percentage going back or a buy one, give one idea? Um, and there's so many great companies that you can take a look at around us that are doing this incredibly well that you can literally just copy how they've built their model. You know, companies like Thank You Water or Tom Shoes are some two really great examples of them. Um, but it comes down to any business will work if you want it to work because there's a, a really good purpose behind it. And if you're that passionate about it, it, it the rest is easy. Mm. A lot of it comes down to mindset and um, you've obviously got some incredible tools on mindset. Could you share your perspective on securing a, a strong foundation and a strong mindset and how important you think it is to business? Oh, wow. It is so important. And I was really lucky to have had um, my experience in promotion for this because it built the foundation for me. You know, putting myself in a position at a young age where all I heard every single day was a thousand people say no to me. It actually allowed me to build this really tough exterior where a no would bounce off me really easily. Mm. Um, so that was a great foundation. Yet there's so many practices that I do in my daily life. I'm sat at my desk right now and I'm looking at my affirmations that are in front of my <laughs> in front of my computer. Mm -hmm. They're in my bathroom. Um, I have, you know, my daily gratitude. I practice every single morning. So I really feel like it's putting yourself in that headspace of gratitude and, and being thankful and um, seeing an obstacle as a really great challenge. Um, you know, to practice overcoming it and to practice being stronger and and just really, if you're in kind of that positive mindset and you're in that flow with everything, then fear doesn't even kind of jump into your head. You know, you don't even allow it to um, have a voice. And the other thing to that, again, I guess I feel very lucky and I'm surrounded by really positive people. And that's one thing I learned really early on. You know, I had grown up with all of these really, really best friends and they'll never stop being my best friends. But I would have people that if I had that crazy idea, they'd say to me, oh, well, I don't know if you should do that. Or if I was facing a tough challenge, you know, they'd be maybe the first person to say, well, yeah, maybe you should try something different. Mm. So I realized early on, well, actually, I need to make sure that I have other people and I don't, you know, maybe I spend quite a bit of time with them. I don't have to get rid of my old friends, but the ones that no matter what comes out of my mouth, they tell me to keep going and it's not a crazy idea and that I can do this. Absolutely. Um, I think like-minded people are critical to success and you've obviously done that in the League of Extraordinary Women and, and you know, broadened your, your network of positive people because everyone's sort of there for the same reasons. That's right. And our favourite saying and quote that we use at the League is that you are the average of your five best friends. Mm. So true, um, isn't it? So it's really important is to take a look at well, who are the five people that you're spending the most time with because they will rub off on you. If they are negative, you will be negative. If they're positive, you'll be positive. It's that simple. Now I want you to be one of my best friends. <laughs> oh, we could be best friends. <laughs> you're gonna take an average of the element of positivity that you have. <laughs> you're gonna be all of my listeners' best friends as well. No, so <laughs> I think when it comes to business as well and, and something that's so purpose-driven, it's also very important to build a team of people with the same vision. How can that mm. catapult you into a new dimension when it comes to success? Oh, well, I mean, you know, power in, power in numbers, mm. power in the movement. Um, and the best thing about running a social project is that there will be hundreds if not thousands of people there that are passionate and mm. driven to do so and make their mark in the world. It's just a case of being a leader that is uh, confident enough to say that dream out loud. Mm. And through, you know, telling those first 25 people about my idea of Project Gen Z, um, it is grown on its own. And that's when you get, that's when you get impact, you know, when you've got those power in numbers. Um, 
and it's been the same with the league. Um, so I feel like just surrounding yourself with great people and, and not being scared to say those dreams and tell people what you're doing. It's funny too, sales sometimes can have a bit of a tacky feel to it and people feel uncomfortable selling things if it doesn't have a, a you know, a strong reason behind it. And I know yeah. a lot of people sort of avoid working in sales, but when sales has something so purpose-driven like that, that will help change the world, it just makes it so much nicer, doesn't it? It does. And even, you know, um, it's funny, yeah, selling in, and you have to do selling, don't you? You know, yeah. and part of running any company is selling, but you'll never sell when you absolutely 100% believe in what you're doing. You'll never need to feel like you're selling mm. because all you're doing is sharing your message and people will like your message or not like it. And if they like it, they come along for the ride as well. Yeah, that's, that's so true. Now, when it comes to your purpose, it's all about the younger generation. What is your reason behind choosing the younger generation as the education standpoint for your purpose? Yeah, good question. I mean, I believe that most perps, uh, most people's purpose comes down to their own life experience, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that going through school, not having any idea what I wanted to do when I grew up, never really feeling good at anything, um, never being the smartest kid in school, but yet being hungry to find something that, to be able to tap my potential, like tap into my potential with. Um, that's my drive. Um, I also, I you know, I was, I was brought up in a great family, like a, a truly supportive family, um, but we didn't have loads of money. So I think being able to then create my own money and to be able to stand on my own two feet from, you know, and using business around that. I want to be able to speak to the next generation, these younger people that felt, have felt the same as me. You know, they, they don't have an, don't know what they want to do when they grow up. Um, and I want to be able to give them an opportunity to look at business because business can, can change their life and change the world. I think that's really where my drive comes from. And then, you know, working with disadvantaged young people, um, being a mum that taps into you know my my big mum heart that I have <laughs> to want to want to help young young kids especially yeah no I, I've got two kids myself and I'm always I was very similar to you I didn't feel like I was ever good at anything um but communication so we both ended up in the same position here with communicating but my kids um, I'm trying to avoid that with my children and really trying to find something that they are passionate about and um, you know, good at at the same time. Mm. Like when you are good at something, it just makes the ride so much easier. But when you have to Definitely. search for what you're good at, it's it can be it can be really grueling. Absolutely, yeah. Who have been your biggest teachers over the time that you have been on your learning journey? I mean, I have a a hero in my eyes, an entrepreneurial hero, and that's Richard Branson. Mm. Um, I love his story. My, his story resonates with me. Um, I think he was someone really early on in my business journey. I would read his books and get a lot of inspiration um, and a lot of drive from his books. And then along the way, I've just met some incredible teachers, one of them being Dr. D. Martini. Um, his lessons and his thoughts around what we should be doing with young people and, and how to help tap into passions and purpose and the education system, I find him just absolutely incredible. And then on the other side of things, um, you know, these incredible world changers, such as Geraldine Cox, the founder of Sunrise. The first time I ever met her, I was at Sunrise very briefly, but then when I came up with my idea, I decided to get the courage to email her. And I remember she agreed well when she was in Australia to meet me. And I felt like this 15-year-old girl walking in to meet my hero. Um, I was stuttering and I told her this idea of what I wanted to do and she just looked at me. <laughs> I mean, she didn't know who the hell I was. <laughs> um, I just kind of was in absolute awe of this incredible woman that had given up her life to rescue, you know, hundreds and hundreds of kids. And just being able to look at role models like Geraldine in my life, it just always makes me want to work harder and know that there's always more that I can do. Um, yeah, so those are the main ones. Oh, I think you've got a lot to share a lot of information that could really help a lot of other people out there and and just kickstart their business journey into changing the world 
and I hate to put oh, you on the spot, you. but are there are there a few top tips that you can give us before we depart to anyone who's got something lingering that they really feel like they need to kickstart and and get off the ground and they've got that lingering fear going on in the back of their mind that sort of is stopping them. Do you have a bit mm. of advice for those people to get us yeah, on the chair and get moving? Honestly, everybody has to do the exercise I mentioned, which is uh, like putting the pieces of paper on the floor um, and challenging yourself to dream for two hours without stopping. You know, turn your mobile phone off, shut your door, tell everyone you're busy, and just see what comes out of your out of your head. Um, and you know, making sure that fear doesn't stop you. Put everything down on paper. If you could design your own life, what would it look like? Because really, that was a really big turning point in my life. It was the first time I'd actually given myself the opportunity to dream on a really big basis. Um, so I'd always start there. And then the second thing is, once you've kind of got a bit of direction, it's really um, it's really looking out for the signs that the universe is giving you on, on where to go mm-hmm. and what steps to take. Um, and lastly action is absolutely everything otherwise it's you know it's just a dream it's just a thought and I think that even if it is a case of saying it out loud or um making that one phone call or writing that first email um just do it mm. just do it without even thinking too much about it and just see what happens when you mentioned following the signs that the universe leaves if something's too difficult if something's a real struggle is that a sign in your opinion that it's probably not the right thing Mm, that's a good question because I mean I've, be, I've faced many many difficult mm. times and mm. I've, not, I've not necessarily given up mm. however over the last you know 15 20 years of me being in business now I can understand the difference between a tough time and me just finding it really hard and wanting to give up rather than when the universe is telling me it's not right yeah I definitely know there is a difference to that um even last year I was attempting to set up a project um with a community here in Australia and I just had this feeling I was trying to make it happen but it was not sitting right and I wasn't being honest with myself for quite a while about it Mm. so I had to take myself away sit down and actually tap into how much do I want this to happen is this actually feeling right and at the end of the day it wasn't and whether that was timing um, whether that was I just wasn't you know passionate enough about it I had to be really honest and put it on hold However, a year, a year year later, I'm revisiting that same project and now it feels right. Mm, now the timing's right. All right. Well, thank you so very, very much. If people want to find you, I know you do a lot of speaking gigs and you can be incredibly inspirational. Where can we find you and how do we reach out? I think probably the easiest way is just jumping onto uh, the Project Gen Z website, which is just projectgenz.com.au and you can reach me through there. Um, otherwise, just follow us on social media and I can chat with you anytime you like. I will definitely be joining my children up to the Dare to Dream project. I think those will be absolutely life-changing for any child out there to sort of really open up their eyes. So congratulations on everything that you have done. Um, Thank you. Thrilled that you've shared your insight on this podcast and we can't wait to see what's ahead for you. I'm Maritza Barone and thank you for listening to the Things You Can't Unhear podcast. I'd love to keep the conversation going. Let us know what you thought of this episode and if something really profound came up for you that you want to share, let's talk about it. You can find me on Instagram at Things You Can't Unhear or on my personal page at Maritza underscore Barone. And if someone you know will benefit from something that was said in this show, make sure you share it with them too. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and keep up to date with what's next. And if you can spare a few seconds, please rate and review the show on iTunes just so other people can find us more easily and quickly. And as always, my friends, be happy, be healthy, be conscious and be kind.